looking at uh, Testimonies of the Church, Volume 2, page 348, paragraph 1. We saw that there was this tension between the lower passions and the higher powers. And there were these people who were essentially making excuses that they were being controlled. What was the page Sorry, 348, paragraph 1. Maybe we should read that. Um, I'll find it quickly. Some will acknowledge the evil indulgence, so the evil of sinful indulgences, yet will excuse themselves by saying they cannot overcome their passions. This is a terrible admission for any person who names the name of Christ. That everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from <coughs> iniquity. Why is this weakness? It is because the animal propensities have been strengthened by exercise until they have gained the ascendancy over the higher powers. Men and women become, when men and women lack principle, they are dying spiritually because they have so long pampered their natural appetites that their power of self-governance, government, seems gone. It hasn't really gone, it just seems gone. The lower passions of their nature have taken the reins, they've taken control, and that which should be the governing power has become the servant of corrupt passion. The soul is held in lowest bondage, sensuality has quenched the desire for holiness and withered spiritual prosperity. So we picked up this idea that the lower passions have taken the reins or control. So we went from there to, I think, two other passages, maybe three other passages that we looked at. And what we saw that this governing power could be expressed in different ways. You've got the governing power, uh, the reason or the conscience, or the high moral principle. And someone mentioned the will, but we haven't discussed the will yet. So I'll, I'll take that out, because we didn't give a spirit prophecy quote for that when we looked at that. So we saw that there were these different ways of expressing the same thing. And then we've started looking a little bit about the conscience. So what we can see is that the conscience is part of the higher powers. <coughs> and not only is it part of the higher powers, um, it's almost certainly connected to the moral part, not to the intellectual or mind part. And the reason is because the definition of conscience is the ability to know what's right and what's wrong. And it's the inner voice that convicts us when things are going wrong or we're doing something wrong. Did anybody have any more thoughts about the conscience before we move on, based upon what we spoke of yesterday? So the conscience is not corrupted, it works fine. <coughs> so the question is, does the, corru does the conscience work fine? Or has it been damaged in some way? I, I assume you're talking about the moral application, right? I'm not sure what you mean by the moral application. We've just defined conscience as right and wrong. <coughs> I didn't put anything else on okay. that. So it could be either prophetical or morally. I'm not making that assertion. I'm, I'm just using a dictionary definition of what conscience means. Conscience means there's part of your being that inherently, by design, knows what's right and knows what's wrong. It's not some kind of gift that you, that you get when you're 20 years old or that you have to pray for or that you have to ask for. So the question of whether or not it's you said cor if it's if it is co uh, corrupted if today, it's corrupted today or is it working? so the, 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 I guess the problem you're asking is before sin was the conscience corrupted no the answer is no after sin wherever you want to go after sin was the conscience corrupted was it damaged in some way sister Kathy um, <clears throat> I found spirit of prophecy. Christ Object Lessons, page 99. 
Uh, it's about the 11. It says, a new standard of character is set up, the life of Christ. The mind is changed. The faculties are aroused to action in new lines. Man is not endowed with new faculties, but the faculties he has are sanctified. The conscience is awakened. We are endowed with traits of character that enable us to do <coughs> service for God. And what does that mean to you? Well, yesterday I said that conscience was dead, and I can see that that's not true. But in light of what Sister White's saying about the conscience awakened, it appears that um, there's some kind of sleeping or some kind of um, not full functioning of the conscience prior to... Um, Read the statement again so everybody can pick it up and then maybe some, someone else will give some comment. The, um, give the reference again. Yes. Uh, Christ Object Lessons 99. Paragraph. Oh, you <coughs> don't have it? Oh, I don't There's have it. 98.3. Okay. Sorry, it's Mine's, what? Mine says 98.3. Is that the computer okay. version? Yeah. Okay, so it's Christ Object Lesson 98.3. <laughs> A it new part. standard of character is set up, the life of Christ. The mind is changed, the faculties are aroused to action in new lines. Man is not endowed with new faculties, but the faculties he has are sanctified. The conscience is awakened. We are endowed with traits of character that enable us to do service for God. So the thing that I get most from that is that before sin, after sin, as you go right down to the degeneracy that we find ourselves in, we had no new faculties. Right. Nothing was taken away and nothing was added. Right. Most of us intellectually are forced to accept that premise, that nothing was taken away, nothing was added. But the way we reason problems out, I'll say the way we excuse our behaviour, is somewhere in the back of our thinking I think many of us don't really believe that. Many of us think that something needs to be added in for things to work properly. Is that because of the wrong understanding of what sin is? Perhaps. I don't know why different people do that, but yeah. to me it's certainly because we keep on looking around yeah. and we keep on looking in the mirror. Mm -hmm. We actually look to our own past experience, our own thoughts and failings and that of others to create a model of religion that is not related to what inspiration tells us that it is. So does the, is her word, conscience is awakened, is that a metaphor? Is she so we'll, we'll try and tackle that bit, Okay. But, but the issue about no new faculties, right. Right. I just want us to maybe explore a little bit about that. Do we really believe there were no new faculties? I believe there are no new faculties, but in order for your faculties that are there and set in place to function properly, you do need to add in the Holy Spirit. When you say function properly... In the way God would want it to function. Okay. That would be pleasing to God. Because they all do function properly, don't they? I mean, well, in a worldly sense, it, it would, but Sorry? not in God's way. Not, in, it, you know, ultimately, God would not. It, most people will function normally, but not the way God would ultimately want them to function. So, I mean, th this person here and this one here, after sin, they've got. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They're still able to think. They still have memories. They still have uh, a conscience without understanding what, what will is, they still have some kind of will, um, they still have an appetite to eat, they still love things, hate things, so everything's still there, but maybe they're not being used um, in the way that God would have them being used. So we, we understand there's something going on uh, between before sin and after sin, but there's no change in the faculties isn't in and of themselves. And not only that, there's no change in the function of those faculties. 
They're all functioning the same way that they used to function. Now people are pretty silent about that, so I don't know if you accept that. But if you did, then you can see there's hardly any difference between sinless and sinful nature. There's hardly any difference. And if I could venture to say, there is no difference. If we think about the faculties and the use of the faculties. Brother Larry. But in this quote here, it says, the mind is changed. The faculties are roused to, to action in new lines. So what does that mean? Is that so something has to change? So the direction in which these faculties take you, they were taking you down one line, and now they're going to take you down a different line. Well, so I would suggest certainly the direction has changed, but not the use of the mind itself or the mechanism of how it's used. <coughs> and I think she's using mind there, not in the way we're using mind. I don't think she's using it like this. I think she's saying the whole thing, the whole being, is going in a different direction. But the mechanism by which it happens is still the same, and the faculties in and of themselves are all the same. Sister Shamila. Um, my understanding is that the conscience can be influenced, so that was said yesterday, influenced into right or into wrong. And what do you mean um, it can be influenced into right or into wrong? What is, this, what is the conscience? Is the conscience the ability to know what's right and what's wrong? Mm -hmm. Yes. So is, is that somehow damaged? So we say consciences nowadays, you know, in the 21st century, consciences can't tell you what's wrong. They don't have that ability anymore. Is that what you mean? Um, I was looking for the scripture where it says to keep your conscience clear so if it, if it needs to be kept clear, that means um, there's things that come into the conscience which would um, make it unclean. Unclean, did you say? Yeah, I mean, so not clear. So if we're supposed to keep it clear, then... Uh, there's, there's things which would... So, kind of let's work. so there's something that's going to come into your conscience. <coughs> and when it comes into your conscience, first you have to ask, what is coming into your conscience? So you'd have to answer that. And then when it comes into your conscience, what does it do? Does it tie your conscience up and say, you're no longer allowed to know what's right and what's wrong? Or you don't have the ability to do that anymore? I'm, it just needs to be rewired, I guess. What does rewiring mean and what does it look like? If you say the ability is there. The conscience job function only is to know what's right and what's wrong and when you're doing wrong to convict you of that. And you're saying it doesn't function anymore. No, I didn't say it doesn't function. I'm saying so why that would it's, need been, rewiring? it's been influenced. Um, in, into the wrong path and if it's gone down the wrong <coughs> path then... So let me stop there. How can the conscience go down the wrong path? Because the, the path is you know what's right and what's wrong. You go to the oracle, you go to the conscience, you say, tell me what's right and what's wrong. And the oracle says, I'm going to go down the wrong path, which means I'm not going to do my job anymore. Is that what you're saying? No, you're not saying that, because you, you kind of infer that, but then you say, actually, I'm not saying that. So I'm saying it doesn't need rewiring. The conscience does not need rewiring. Because when you go to the oracle and you say, is it right or is it wrong? The conscience will say, hold on a minute, let me have a check. So it gets its secret book out and has a check and it says, oh, it's wrong. And the problem is, it's using a wrong book. That's what the problem is with the conscience. It's the book that it's using 
what it's consulting isn't correct. But the conscience itself doesn't need to be rewired. It works perfectly well. It's always worked well. It's always done what it's supposed to do. Because if we were to believe that it doesn't work properly, why would you ever go and consult it? The problem with the conscience, it doesn't have good information. And the information is here. That's how people can do strange things and be conscience free. I mean, when I was saying influence, I mean, what, what is it that kind of... So is, does the Holy Spirit influ um, work upon the conscience? The answer has to be no. Because the conscience is designed to know what's right and what's wrong. A mathematician doesn't pray to the Holy Spirit and say, help me to do maths properly. The yeah, intellect is able to do that there's inherently. Only, there's only two spirits. There's only the Holy Spirit and an evil spirit. And people unknowingly don't realise that whenever they do something good, it's only because of the Holy Spirit. They may not believe in the Holy Spirit or pray for the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't mean to say that the Holy Spirit isn't working in their lives. The Holy Spirit is always imperceptibly working in our lives. That's where you and I fundamentally disagree then. We di I disagree that a human being without the Holy Spirit is able to do right. Because your argument is going to say this, that if you want to run a marathon and lose weight and come off diabetic medication by exercise and natural remedies, you have to have the Holy Spirit driving that. You cannot do it in your own strength. It's and you know that you don't believe that, and then you're going to keep on saying, actually, it can only happen through the Holy Spirit. And now you're going to develop a model that says the billions of people in this world who do that very thing are doing it by the Holy Spirit and they didn't even know. And if the Holy Spirit can do that to them, why on earth would they need to become Christians? Because the Holy Spirit is controlling them and they're not even Christians. Because Sister White says... Answer my question. People. No, answer my question. Because you've developed a model that says non-Christians can be saved because the Holy Spirit does something to them. So they no need to make a confession and acceptance Are of Christianity. Are keeping the law of God without even knowing about Jesus and the Ten Commandments? Is yes, that a rhetorical question, or you don't know the answer I, to that? I'm asking, are there people... Uh, is it rhetorical, or don't you know? I know the answer. So you tell me what the answer is. They do. They keep the law of God probably more than we do. Without the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yeah, I mean, they, you just said two they minutes may not accept the Holy Spirit. You said two minutes ago that they couldn't happen. What couldn't happen? <coughs> that they can't do good without the Holy Spirit. You said they couldn't do it. You said it does it imperceptibly. They're, yeah, they're doing good without realising that it's the Holy Spirit that is there you go empowering again. them to do it. There you go again. They can't do good without the Holy Spirit empowering them and they didn't even ask his permission. So now God is going to force you to do stuff that he, does, that he wants you to do. You can't even help it. Brother Jason. Um, I believe that the conscience is an inner law. An inner, inner law. Law. Yeah, the reason why I say is that because I, I read a quotation in the Spirit of Prophecy and she said that the, the conscience is the voice of God. So I'm looking at the conscience as an inner law. The reason for that is before you do something wrong, the conscience starts to tell you that not to do it. And the law is like that. The law is like a mirror. So I'm looking at the conscience in that in that. In Give that me light. an example of like when you say the law. Um, the law points out your sin. So, I'm not sure if that's correct, because it seems to me that the law is a number of words that say this is good and this is bad. And the conscience here has to go to this place, the library where the law is held, and find out what the law says. It's not the law itself. It goes to the law and says, tell me what the law says. Connected with the intellect. It's connected with information. Okay. 
its ability to tell you what's right and wrong functions perfectly well, but it doesn't know what's right and wrong. Okay. Um, the, reason, the reason why I say that because through the conscience convict you of your wrongs. Um, so I was just looking in that line. How does the conscience know what's right and what's wrong? Go to the intellect to yeah. give up the information. Brother Larry. Uh, Romans 2, 14 and 15. Might help Jason here on the spot. Romans 2, 14 and 15. Okay, if you're going to read a Bible verse to us, you've got to be willing to explain what it means. You can't just pick up a Bible verse that says the okay, word conscience in it. No, it. uh -uh, it's too late. <laughs> the law is written on the heart. Romans chapter 2, I'll read, the, I'll read them out for the um, audio and then you can explain it. Uh, chapter 2 verse 14, I'll pick up from verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So I think that he's saying that they don't understand the Ten Commandments. People who aren't Christians or live in another third world country where they haven't heard the Ten Commandments. They already know by their conscience what is right and what is wrong. What and it's like right. a law with it. It's like a law That's what of the Okay, so when they're born, they know fundamentally the difference between certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong. I don't know if certain, but I guess. Well, they most, don't know everything. Most, well, yeah, not everything. Okay. There because you go. you've got millions of people who weren't born knowing that Sabbath is the right day. Yes, that has to be taught. I agree with that. So there's some things that they know inherently, and some things they have to be taught. Amen. And when we, so the problem is they don't have a full grasp a full set of information. They don't have everything there. So someone has to go and teach them some extra information. Anyone else on those two verses? Elder Jeff. Oh, no, I don't know on those two verses, oh. but by beholding we become changed. And so the changing is taking place in our information, uh, <coughs> not in our conscience. Two things I want to... I've, I've already said this one about the, inform the, the mind, the information. So I'm, make, I'm now making the assertion here that when we had the degeneracy of the human race, pre-sin, post-sin, the, the moral and the, the higher powers, the intellect and the moral, were not degenerated. They didn't change. They worked perfectly well. The problems that have arisen is the conscience worked well before and it works well now. The mechanism by which it works hasn't changed. It doesn't need to be rewired in, in, in that kind of, in the way that most people would understand rewiring. The intellect hasn't changed either. Its ability to amass information, you do memorization. It may be much harder now because our brains don't work as well, we've become weakened, but the mechanism by which that happens is all fixed. If, if you look at, if, if, you, if you watch a, a good series on health reform, you know, by, by someone who knows what they're talking about, and they'll tell you how, uh, or someone who understands about brown, brain science, how the, the wiring of the synapses and all the nerve endings, how they all connect together. That's how it was always done. It, you know, it, it might not work as well, but it hasn't changed. There doesn't, mean, there doesn't need to be some new mechanism by which we memorise. It was hard work then and it's hard work now. The way you know information is an angel sits with you and tells you stuff. It goes in through your senses, gets into your faculty and resides there through chemical reactions and electrical impulses. That's how it was done pre-sin and that's how it's done post-sin. So there's no change. There's weaknesses because of 6,000 years of DNA damage and all that kind of stuff. But the mechanism hasn't degenerated. So I'm saying this hasn't changed and this hasn't changed. But the lower powers 
are just out of control. There's huge changes in that part of our being. Huge changes. But the other two, there haven't been any changes. So for us all to sort of say amen, I think there's probably been quite a big change in our thinking. Uh, so let's go to, unless anybody's got any more comments, let's go to First Timothy. Because this is, there are many good conscience Bible, uh, conscience verses in the scriptures, but this is the one that most people are going to turn to. First Timothy chapter 4. So before we read it, um, Sister Kathy, if you just reread that statement from Christ Object Lessons, because we're going to pick up this thought about this idea of being awakened or sleeping. A new standard of character is set up, the life of Christ. The mind is changed, the faculties are roused to action in new lines. Man is not endowed with new faculties, but the faculties he has are sanctified. The conscience is awakened. We are endowed with traits of character that enable us to do service for God. So, what are the new lines that it's referring to in that passage? So when it says sanctified, what does sanctified mean? Made holy. Made Put to a holy use. Put to a holy use. Set apart for holy use. Mm -hmm. So is that the new lines? Mm -hmm. Before your purpose in life was self-centered, doing your own thing, and now your life has been set apart for holy use, which is the new direction, the new lines in which you're traveling down. Your whole being is now set in that, w in that way. Doing the right things for the right reason. Yeah. So, verse 2. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. What does that mean? Sister Kathy. I don't know what that means, but okay. that's been my question, and I, w I asked him, and he told me to ask you, what does it mean to have your conscience seared? And you went to this, so yeah, I wanted to talk about it. <laughs> okay, so I don't have the answer. So let, me, let me begin by saying that, but maybe we can work it out together, because two minds are better than one. Let's just, uh, what is, what, just at a basic level, what is that verse saying? Their consciences have been seared uh, with a hot iron. Dumbed down. It's being destroyed. So our consciences have been dumbed down. They've, be, it's, they've been destroyed. It's more than that. When you, when you see what an iron, a hot iron does to a piece of fabric or something, it melts it. It actually changes it. It sears it, so there's a change. When a hot iron hits, I'm just using the literal. Okay. Brand. So right, it's been branded. Yeah. Sister Antonisha, and then Sister Susan, and then Brother Larry. In the Hebrew, it also means to render unsensitive. Are you sure? That's what's here. Are you certain? That's Greek. <laughs> sorry, Greek. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I did, but... <laughs> <laughs> Go again, sorry. So in the Greek it means to render unsensitive. That's the word seared. Surrender what? To, to render, render unsensitive. unsensitive. And that's what I was going to do. You're doing the same thing? Go to render unsensitive. So let, let's just go with that thought. To render unsensitive. What does that mean? How could you render? I'm saying the conscience does not need rewiring works perfectly well, even in opposition to this verse. So if it's seared, which renders it... You just said it's been damaged. According to this verse? No, is that what you meant, according to this verse? I thought you said it's been damaged when it's 
says, um, because that's what it's saying. If something's been seared... Hence, yeah, so I'm saying there's some damage to the conscience. So we're, we're trying to work out what it is. It's now rendered what? Unsensitive. Unsensitive. Okay, so what makes the conscience sensitive or unsensitive? So... Not speaking right. No. Let's try to put our hands up. Uh, Sister Susan, uh, you had your comment. Yeah, I was just thinking, um, just to give a lightness, is you know like you have a piece of wood and you sand it down, the grain of that has now been removed, so that the, the, like the pathway within the grains is no longer there, so you're just left to anything really. I don't know if you understand so you're left? Is. Because you, you, you know, a piece say, of wood... No, I understood that, yeah. you're left to what? Just tell me the word you said. I can't remember, but basically you're just... You're left to anything. Yeah, you're just, you're not really following any specific... Directionless. Yes, yeah. So, if you had direction, would it all work fine? Because I'm also thinking... Oh, let me ask someone, answer my sorry, question. question. If you had direction, yeah. you said you get the piece of wood, you sand it now, and yeah. there's no direction because yeah. you can't follow the grain. Yeah. So, if it rained a bit, or something happened, and the grain came back, would you be able to find your direction again? It would help. So it would you can't say it would help because yeah. that's your yeah. that's your model that yeah. you've developed. So <coughs> the problem isn't its ability to do something. It's the problem is the lines have gone. Yeah. Because you know, like. Um, so what in that in that analogy? What are you saying has been hurt? It's the conscience. Because okay. no, you didn't say that. What you're saying is. The information. Yeah, let me give you another um, analogy. You know, a moral compass. You know, that's what the compass, the, the, the conscience is. A sat nav, uh, a GPS, you would say in America, when it's not updated, it will send you down the wrong road. And that's the information that's within that. So it's just, I'm just looking at it like that. If, if, the, if the grain has gone, the information that you needed to follow that pathway is not there. So the grain is the information. Mm. Not the ability to follow the yeah, grain. Yeah, because the, the ability is working. It's there. It's 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 the inform as you said earlier on. It's the information. Okay, brother Larry had the same point. So let's. Uh, I I just see your hand. Are you going to answer the question about <coughs> the inability to rendering unsensitive the conscience? Unsensitive. Are you going to answer that? Okay. So the conscience has become unsensitive or insensitive. Um, the word, as Antonisha had pointed out, um, the word, first thing that, that's there is brand. And Sister Cathy had used it as with an iron, but I think it's more like with a cattle mm -hmm. or an animal. Have you ever seen persons yeah, stamping right. their, mm -hmm. they use a... Yeah, 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 carry on. Yeah, so that's it, like, it's another imprint, as you have been saying, that has been stamped another source or of information is now feeding that it's branded with a different okay so now we've got two completely different models mm -hmm. <laughs> you either get a steak and you put it on a cooker and you sear it which is not the same as branding That's right. It's, it's two totally different That's things. What the so when we're going to go for this, the searing, is it the first one where you cook the thing to death, or you get an <coughs> iron and you wreck the thing, or is it about branding? Because when you brand a castle, it's the same thing that all you're talking about is ownership. That's the first definition that is there, brand. So if we're going to use that concept of branding, <laughs> and we're going to use the other one of rendered insensitive. What does it mean that the conscience is now is no longer sensitive? Is that because it doesn't work properly? I'm saying no. So how can it be insensitive now? What makes it insensitive? So A different concept. What makes it insensitive? When something's burnt... No, no, no. I'll ask my question. Not the branding, I'm moving off branding, I'm going to insensitive. Insensitive is not branding. How did you? That's right. Can we all see that? Mm -hmm. The conscience works fine. Mm -hmm. Could you say which direction to go in? It says, I don't have good information. 
The insensitivity is not its ability to know things. It's a, its problem is it's information based. To render unsensitive, I have problems with my German translation. Can you read another? One? The word insensitive? To render insensitive. Render means yeah. make. To make. Okay. Insensitive, you know that one. Yeah. Okay. You've made it insensitive. It, it, it no longer. It, it, yeah, I was just saying, no longer insensitive. Brother Tyler, Sister Terry. The context in verse 1 is that these are people who, who had something they had truth they had the right bit of information and now they're departing from that truth and the consequence is that their conscience is now insensitive so you don't want to go to context do you no sorry, sorry <laughs> no no i'm just <laughs> laughing i'm just laughing because we don't normally go to conscience we, we did that in class for the visitors who, who aren't here uh we don't go to context we just pick a word Whatever's on that board, unless you went through the class, doesn't really make much sense because it was just um, brainstorming. But if you don't check context, you come up with some really strange ideas. Um, Sister Terry. I was going to context. <laughs> okay, so you, you, verse one, you're going to go. Is Actually, that verse two. You got talking about well. It, Okay, so we'll leave verse one for the moment. Yeah, but, but, but it's connected, of course. Okay, before you go to context, just want to make sure that we've, we've dealt with this issue about the conscience and the searing <coughs> of the conscience. So just a couple of comments on that if people want to. The sister... <laughs> my sister, uh, Olivine, is saying it's not getting an iron and wrecking the shirt, it's putting a logo onto the shirt. That's what's being brought to view here. It's about logos. And the reason why that's important to understand is because what's our most famous passage about logos? Testimonies to Ministers, page 38, paragraph 1. Think upon themselves the brand of Antichrist. The branding of Antichrist, the kings of the earth, kings, rulers and governors have taken upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are portrayed as being the dragon power. So they can be as much of a dragon power as they want, but it doesn't actually do any harm to anybody. Because the thing that turns you from a lamb to a dragon, Revelation 13, 11, is what? Just from that passage, the one we're just reading now, it would be what? It's the branding. It's the branding that turns you from a lamb to a dragon. And so this concept of branding isn't wrecking shirts, it's about logos. <coughs> so if, we, if we're okay with that premise, then we can start looking about the context. But two people had their hand up, Sister Alyssa. In the Christ Object lesson, she says that the promise of obedience, they appear to fulfill when this involves no sacrifice, but when self-denial and self-sacrifice are required, when they see the cross to be lifted, they draw back. Thus the conviction of duty wears away, and known transgression of God's commandments becomes habit. The ear may hear God's word, but the spiritual perceptive powers have departed. The heart is hardened, the conscience seared. Um, you've been I, I agree with the information has been um, distorted. So does that not mean that there needs to be some rewiring taking place if the information has been um, changed. Because I agree The that rewiring of what? The information. Information is not here. Information is here. Conscience is here. Information is here. Different faculty. So conscience comes under will. Is that correct? Not under will. It comes under the high moral principle. This one. Moral is more than just conscience, there's other things, but it's conscience. So if we're going to talk about rewiring, then the rewiring is information. That's what I'm saying, yeah. But the information is not connected to the damage of the conscience itself. Yeah, I'm talking about the information. It's 
condition that would need to be um, changed. Yeah. Not, not the conscience itself. So, did everybody pick up what Sister Alyssa said? Because she's given another definition of searing. The Just read the quote. The promise of obedience they appear to fulfill when this involves no sacrifice, but when self-denial and self-sacrifice are required, when they see the cross to be lifted, they draw back. Thus the conviction of duty wears away, and known transgression of God's commandments becomes habit. So this is what I am seeing. It. It's not the information that's that's changed. It's our route to sets of information. If we're ignoring the, if we're it's not our it's no it's not our route. <laughs> known transgression of God's commandments. God's commandments haven't changed. The information hasn't changed. It's our habitual actions. It's our our habits. The ear may hear God's word, but the spiritual perceptive powers have departed. So that, this is what creates the searing. The heart is hardened, the conscience seared. The spiritual perceptive powers, that creates the desensitization. So we've just developed a model which is branding. And the branding is to do with what? Ownership. Ownership but it's to do with lack of information, isn't it? So you've got this issue of lack of information. So that's one area about searing our consciences. This is another uh, definition, if you like, another realm. What was the gist of that passage? Is there a problem of information? No. No, so this one isn't a problem. You've got all the information. So then now the problem is, You've got the information, but you're just not following the information. So Ellen White's going to use it in this context, and she does it in a number of places, that you have all the information, you know what you're supposed to do, but you don't do it, and then your conscience becomes seared, or not dis unsensitive, or desensitised. Becomes desensitised when you know what you're supposed to do, and you don't do it. So there's that problem, and there's a whole other problem that you actually don't even have an information base. <coughs> Sister Terry? Which is the context of verse 2. Which one? <coughs> the having the information and not following it. They're speaking lies in hypocrisy. So they know what's truth. Okay, so I'll, I'll read verse 2 and you tell us what it's saying. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So they're, they're saying untruths because they're false teachers, but they actually know what the truth is. So they've got an information base that's correct. Yes. And they're not following it. No. So their consciences have become desensitized. Well, it brands them as something. Um, just on the point of branding, is it valid to say you could replace that with stamp? Yes. Okay. Brother Tyler, context. We'll read verse 1, then tell us what you're saying. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused, for if it be received with thanksgiving, sorry, if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Did you want to make comment or are you just telling this context? My, I was just looking at verse 1, I didn't, I didn't read the rest okay. of it, but in verse 1 you see that you have a group of people that were in the faith and they depart from the faith and when they do that, they obviously know the correct, they have the truth like Sister Terry is saying, but now they're going to be hypocrites and go against that truth and by doing that they're 
desensitizing or searing their conscience. Do you have you had that? No, I was, I was going to say, um, could we use another word like willful ignorance? Willful ignorance? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, verse 3, do we know what most people or whom this is normally talking about when you pick up verse 3? Because if you ask most evangelical Christians, they'll tell you it's Adventist. Because we say you're not allowed to eat all of this nice food. No, but the church teaches that before I begin to marry, there is the tape of the... Which church? When you say the church. <laughs> yeah, we, we want to apply it to the papacy, but most people apply these verses to us. They, they don't deal with the marriage bit, but they like the meat bit. The meat is just food. Yeah, but it says, God sanctified, don't call anything unclean, which I have called clean, as that means you can eat pork nowadays. Yeah, that, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It, it was all sanctified. And this is their primary argument that Adventism is a cult. Because mm -hmm. we fit into that criteria. But we say, what, is it, what does this mean? Forced fasting. Um, celibacy. Yeah? All of that, sister. Um, in, um, I don't know what book it is. A-R-S-H. July Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald. Okay. Um, she says that for that verse... Which what, verse 4? Mm-hmm. Okay. It should be understood by all that in the Bible the word meat does not necessarily mean flesh. It is the old Saxon word for food of any kind and is not in itself right. distinctive. Right. Flesh verse means three. flesh. And verse, verse 3. Verse 3, yeah. And is that spirit of prophecy? Because it doesn't sound like it. No. Okay, is that, you got, are you doing it online? Yes. No, I did it on the, the app. The app. Uh, okay, so yeah, on the new app. I, don't, I think the new app includes, I think it includes, that doesn't sound like Spirit I Prophecy. I've been in this room, so 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 I've been in Okay, so let me ask a, a question. What is the gospel? Sorry? A message. The gospel is the message. One aspect is prophecy. It's a message. You're not going to define what that message is? Sorry? You're not going to define it, you say it's a message. And my brother's saying one aspect is prophecy. If I put an E in front of it, does that make it any different? No. Same thing? Okay, so I'll tell you what I think prophecy is, uh, gospel is, because no one wants to participate. <laughs> the everlasting gospel is a three-step prophetic testing message which does a number of things. Do we agree with that? So, let's not get personal. Is this a divinely inspired statement? Yes. There's 25 people here. <laughs> no one's... Yeah, one person did. Yes. Is this divinely inspired? Yeah, yeah. Define divinely inspired. So, I'm, I'll leave... <laughs> so you define it, because you said yes. <laughs> is it a definition that is given from the Word of God? Yes. So she says it's, it's, it's given from the Word of God. So she's got a Bible verse that teaches that. Or a couple of them. Revelation 14, 6 to 12. Revelation 14, 6 to 12. Sister Shamila? Also the... Um, 
part which I usually know that follows that is... Um, I'm not asking that. It's that first part. You said it's true. I said, and I said, how do you know? Is it divinely inspired? Is it, is it an inspired statement? You said it was. And I said, yes, divinely uh, inspired. And someone said, define that. Based on a number of <coughs> biblical references, such as... Um, no, let, me sto let me stop you there. I'm saying you're not allowed to eat rabbits. Is that a divinely inspired statement? Okay, some people are saying it is, and some people are saying it isn't. Eat rabbits. So if I quote scripture, does that make it a divinely inspired statement that I'm making? Sorry? No. But it's, a divine, it's a divine truth. But it's not a scriptural quote. Do people say, see the difference? So if I quote scripture, now I'm divinely inspired. No, not in that context. That's the context that you're using it here. Uh, no. So now you're backing out of that and say I no. No, I'm not backing out of what I said that I stand by what I believe. I believe that is a divinely inspired um, definition. So I'm not backing out of that. I'm saying that not because you quote scripture, it doesn't make it divinely inspired. So what so makes I'm just clarifying So what makes this divinely inspired then? She quoted Revelation fourteen, six through twelve. Exactly, but now she's saying you can't do that to make it divinely inspired. I'm not I s listen, cut we're, we're trying to cut. listen. So let me use Tyler's um, statement where he said context. Not everyone that I can quote scripture and how I choose to quote scripture it doesn't mean that it makes it divinely inspired. If you quoted it correctly what, is that, what would that Even mean? Even if I quote it correctly, I can't, this, the devil was quoting scriptures to Christ. Correctly. In some aspect. He no, he was wasn't. He was or to quote one See, word. contextually, he wasn't doing it correctly. But even so, contextually, I can quote scripture and still use it wrong contextually. I'm asking if you used it contextually correctly, don't think about the negative, think about the positive, because this is a positive statement. Mm. If you do it Contextually correctly, is it divinely inspired? Not in every case, no. But in some cases? I believe so. Because it's referencing back to a Bible quote? No. Then what makes it divinely inspired? <coughs> I'll think about them. Okay. It'd have to be fulfilled. No. Because how do, you, how do you test a prophet? There's tests to a prophet. You have to test their words. Okay, so now you're introducing the concept that if it's divinely inspired, it may, then I must be a prophet to say you can't eat rabbit. No. Is that what you mean? Um, I was basing it on that. Go on um, that. So is this divinely inspired or not? Yes, because you'd have to test it. <coughs> You have to test it to, to the law and the testimony um, to see if there's light in it. Okay. You, you didn't define uh, divine inspired yet. Neither did you. <laughs> I That's didn't my say something. Point. Now you, why are you not participating divine. in my class? <laughs> <laughs> That's, what I want. That's my problem, you're not saying anything, so you're making me to say everything. No, you were asked to define it. I was asked to define it. Someone asked me a question, and I'm the facilitator of this class, <coughs> so I want to direct people. So I want people to give their ideas, not just me give my idea. It would be really funny if I did that. So I'll do it now, in this, just for you. I'm saying, if it's divinely inspired, then the prophet has spoken. That's what, that's the, to me, what would make it divinely inspired. Mm. Yeah? <coughs> okay. 
The dispensational prophet has spoken it. So, is it inspired now? A dispensation means when you go from one way of doing something, or one era of history, like the patriarchal system, to the Levitical system, to the Melchizedek system, like that. Or Revelation 2 and 3, Ephesus, that dispensation, to Smyrna, to Pergamos. Dispensations of the same thing, different <coughs> periods of time. Judgment of the dead to the judgment of the living. So to, to, for me, to have something inspired means a prophet has to speak that. Not a person has to quote inspiration, quote a Bible verse. Because me quoting Bible verses doesn't qualify me to be a prophet. It just qualifies me to be a regurgitator of truth. So if it was an inspir inspired statement, then a prophet would have had to have done that. And the prophet would have had to be a prophet that's around, which I would say is a prophet that's dispensational, that's living in that dispensation. So does that change our perspective of things now? Sorry? Okay, the reason I ask is because everywhere I go and I ask people this question, they always say no, they don't actually believe that. that it's a three-step prophetic testing message. The rest of it we could just add on, but it's that bit that people balk at. Let me find this passage. We've read it a number of times. We've read it over and over again at the Prophecy School. And I still can't remember where it's found. 343. Can you paraphrase that for us? Yep. I'll, I'll read it then, I'll find it. Well, I did it a number of times, I only quote paragraph 2 but not paragraph 1. Paragraph 1, if you don't put paragraph 1 in context of paragraph 2, the passage loses, it loses its edge. But I'm, I'm going to do that, I'm not going to read paragraph 1. But what I want to pick up is this, halfway into the passage, but no man, however honoured of heaven, has ever attained to a full understanding of the great plan of, of redemption or even to a perfect appreciation of the divine purpose in the work for his own time. I'll read that again, then you tell me what that meant. Where are you reading from? GC 343 paragraph 2. But no man, however honoured of heaven, has ever attained to a full understanding of the great plan of redemption or even to a perfect appreciation of the divine purpose in the work for his own time. What does that say to you? Sorry? That we don't understand. No, not we. The, this, the, the prophet doesn't the understand prophet. the words he's speaking. Oh, the the prophet more, does what? Doesn't Brother understand Tyler. the full import of the words he's speaking. So he's speaking words. And is he speaking words appropriate to his time? Yes. So we agree with that. And is he making any mistakes? No. Uh, we, uh, we agree with that. So when he speaks, he doesn't make any mistakes, but he doesn't actually understand what he's saying. Right. Can he have a misconception of things? Yes. Mm -hmm. He can have misconceptions, he can have faulty thoughts and ideas, but what he says true. is inerrant, which is a fancy way of saying he didn't make any mistakes. Mm -hmm. So we have to ask ourselves the question, is this a divinely inspired statement, or did we just kind of cobble it together and make it up. And if you're going to use Sister Shamila's answer, her response to that is, what do you do? You test it. So you have to keep on testing and testing to see if it bears weight. If it doesn't bear weight, what have you discovered, Sister Shamila? Um, I mean... You can make mistakes, can you not? God, make, God can make mistakes. No, I mean the, the God human can make mistakes? vessel. God can make mistakes? God can never make mistakes. So when he sends a man, he says, tell them 
my words that you ate and you're going to vomit them out, regurgitate them, can they be a mistake? No. So, the man, the men, do they make mistakes? No. They, they can't make mistakes. This is Isaiah 35 verse 8. If you're on the path, you cannot err. And people just don't like to hear that. They don't <coughs> like to hear that this movement cannot make mistakes. Prophetically. Sorry? Prophetically. If you want to add that in, I don't mind if you want to, if you want to qualify it. So what you have to do is a prophet raises up. And if you want to test the prophet, whether there is a prophet or not, you have to get with that statement and put some analysis to it. You have to test it, you have to prove it. So, have we been proving this statement? The reason I ask is because wherever I go, <coughs> I say, do you agree with that statement? And he says, of course I agree with it. And, th and then we start putting some weight on it, then they say, actually I don't. What happens if you add your words or take the words out from an inspired statement? What happens to you? You get cursed, didn't you? Yeah, you get cursed. Because everywhere I go, people say, okay, that looks pretty good, but what we'll do is, what, what the prophet really meant was, it's a three-step prophetic and moral testing message. They always want to add that in. Always want to add that in. And I'm saying, okay, so what you're telling me is, either it's not an inspired statement, just some ad hoc thing that someone threw together when they had a bit of spare time, or you're not on the message. So I don't know what people think here. Did they, did they think it is prophetic or it's not? The reason why I asked the question is because back here we had a, just a message and it says one aspect. Someone else can. I don't know how to do things simply. The gospel is not one aspect. It is not prophecy. Is not one aspect. The gospel is prophecy. It is a testing prophecy. Larry demonstrated what he sees across the board. <coughs> that Larry defined the gospel as a message. And one aspect of it was prophecy, which means there's got to be another aspect to it. And Parminder's saying usually people are going to say that other aspect is moral. And so, Brother Parminder's walking through the logic, so Brother Larry can fine tune his definition. Yeah, I was thinking when I, when I mentioned that, is that the word gospel means good news. That's all I was thinking. So, one aspect of it is the good news. But I know that in Desire of Ages it says that gospel is prophecy. The message that Christ came to share is a prophecy. I, I took up my phone out. I got this message. It said this. I'm sure by now you realize that you court controversy a lot. I wonder if that is a strategy of yours. And my answer is I don't court controversy and I don't have a strategy to... What did they say? Court controversy. Court. court. Controversy? They say, I court... By now, I'm sure you realise that you court controversy a lot. I invite it. I wonder if you, this is a strategy of yours. And I'm saying... I mean, it's a, it's a question. I'm, my answer to that person is, no, I don't court controversy and I don't have a strategy. All I'm trying to do is just trying to understand what our reform line is. I don't do things provocatively, it's not a game. And people think that it is, and I want to know, why are they thinking that? Do they think I'm disingenuous, or I've got some secret motive, or the people are, not, are people saying this isn't serious, this is just some kind of Bible study game that we're all doing? and we'll just jump through words and numbers and look up dictionary definitions because it's all fun. People here have paid <coughs> a lot of money, people waste a lot of time watching videos if this is what they think this is all about. Because I thought this was a life and death testing message. 
and God forbid that I would maliciously or deliberately play around and court controversy just for the sake of it. I'm genuinely trying to understand for myself, so I'm bringing my questions to you. Do you believe that this is divinely inspired? Do you believe we have a dispensational prophet? So if that's the case, why are we adding to this? Because my understanding is when we add to the scripture or we take away, is because what we're doing is coming to the Bible, having preconceived ideas which are based upon our experience or the experience of other people, because we're looking around at everybody and we're saying, surely it can't be so because everybody in my church taught me that messiahs don't die. So when the messiah says, I'm going to die, maybe he's talking about something else. Maybe we don't want to listen to what he says. Maybe we'll just ignore it. Maybe we'll rebuke him and tell him off instead of just taking him at his word when it's all contrary to what we ever were taught or understood. So I, I understand that the gospel is some good news. It's all, you know, embellished with morality. So I'm struggling, it's just the same way everyone else is struggling, that how do you reconcile, how do I reconcile my preconceived ideas, which I didn't invent, by the way, they were handed to me on a plate, and now someone stands up and says, everything that you were ever taught was all wrong. And that person doesn't come around helping me. They just put a bombshell to me and then leave me to sort the problem out myself. That's how I feel. I don't know how you feel. So when I do that to you, to say, do you feel in the same mess that I feel that I'm in? People say I caught controversy and I'm saying I didn't do that. It's the prophet that caused the problem in the first place. It wasn't me. <laughs> and the prophet was the voice piece of God. So God calls the problem. Matthew 13, he maliciously and deliberately is going to code his language so that no one can understand. And if we're not sure about that, go to Isaiah 6. We, we, we've gone through this a, a number of times already. I don't know why there's all this issue about Isaiah 6, is it 9-11 or midnight? Because to me, all of that is a moot point. It's an irrelevant point, whether it's 9-11 or midnight, and people hang up on all of that stuff. To me, the crux of this is verse 9 and 10, and then into 11. It's 9-11. That's what the issue of Isaiah 6 is. I'll read from verse 9, but it's verse 10 I want to go to. And he said, Go and tell these people, Hear indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. And now he's going to tell you why. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. This statement here was maliciously put together so that you can't even be saved. That's how I read that. I don't know how everybody else reads verse 10. You give a message to harden people's heart not to soften it, not to make it understandable, to make it, I'm going to say malicious, deliberately, maliciously hard. And so I know that's the case because we keep on adding our own words in there to massage the information. The reason why Isaiah 6, 8, 9, 9 to 11 is important because this is what Jesus is quoting when the issue comes up in Matthew 13. The whole issue of wheat and tares, the whole division that's being caused now is based upon this premise that messages are given that people don't understand and they have to work through it. We should be spending as much time, if not more time, on our knees than we do in studying so that we have a clear understanding of what's going on. So is the problem that incorrect understanding is the understanding that is... Um, not right. I'm saying God drops a bombshell on us. And what I'm asking is, it's been around for a few years and nobody seems to have seen that 
a bomb hit us. That it's staring us in the face, it says a three-step prophetic test. Every word must have its proper bearing. And, I, and I, I've got in trouble again on this issue, that I said I don't understand William Miller's rules. And everybody says, they're easy. Alan White says they're simple rules. And I'm saying they're not simple rules. And, and in yesterday's class and the class before, we've proven it's not simple. People read the words and they don't understand what, what to do with it. I'm not trying to, I can't remember even who said it, so I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. We went to a Bible verse and I said, tell me what the Bible verse means. And someone says, you mean literally? They asked the question like, you want us to look at it literally? And I said, how else are you supposed to look at it if not literally? Isn't that a rule? And so we've got people who claim to know the rules, maybe even memorise some of them, don't even apply them because we're not familiar with, uh, with doing them. It's not normal, it's counterintuitive of how to apply William Miller's rules. And one of them is, it says, they should all have their proper bearing. So if that's the case, and it says prophetic test, what I'm trying to do is understand, is that the case or not? And if it's proven to be not true, the ripple effects are serious. Because you can't say, well, it's okay, he's only a man. Because I'm only a man. Yeah, I, I'm just a man. I, could, I can make lots of mistakes and I can get off scot-free. If I'm teaching some mistakes or error, the movement carries on. And just, I just get dropped by the wayside. Okay, so I enough of that sort of preaching stuff. I if this is the case, three-step prophetic testing message. I want to try and understand this in the context of conscience, of right and wrong. Brother Larry. Can you raise one aspect? One aspect. Oh, 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 you mean, you, okay, we, we just, we'll just take all of that out. Sister Shimela? I was just saying, so the gospel equals prophecy, and that's it. You say that, you sound surprised when you say that. No, I mean, no, I'm, ask, I'm just saying that. No, you're asking, I'm asking, why are you asking? Definition. You've been on the message for ages. So I still haven't answered that question, it's funny. Time of the end, conviction, John 16, verse 8. We're on the same page there. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin. So the question is, why is he convicting you of sin when you've already got a conscience? In darkness. Sorry? In darkness. In darkness. So, this, so this, there is a, some kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. So we want to try and tack, tie this piece of information of why this is happening, because it's fundamental to reform line. I know the most important way, Marks, are the increase of knowledge and the formalisation. And the reason is, because of Deuteronomy 18.18 18, and Jeremiah 31.33. They're the places that I would go to to demonstrate and prove that the... Because that the, they're the same way, Mark, the increase of knowledge and the formalisation. That is the way, Mark, that everybody has to go to because it's great controversy, 343. But the time of the end is the one that our whole movement hinges upon, isn't it? You have to get Daniel 11 verse 40 correct. We should be spending a lot of time understanding that, those, that verse because there's much that we don't understand it, especially when we're teaching our message. If you don't understand the time at the end, everything gets destroyed. So I'm not trying to say this is the most important way, Mark, in that context because we've all, I've already demonstrated that it's because it, you need to know about the men. But without the time at the end, you have nothing. So... At the very beginning of a reform line, I should sort of really take this out. The first thing God's going to tell us is that the Holy Spirit's going to convict us of sin. And that has to drive us to a place where we're dealing with conscience now. Because the purpose of conscience is to know right and wrong and to convict us of that. And as soon as you get into this realm, 
Now you're having to deal with the nature of man. So we've got to bring in a number of concepts, time of the end, conviction by the work of the Holy Spirit, the nature of man and the everlasting gospel, because it's all about prophecy. So let's come back to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So what are these people doing? So they've departed from the faith. Why have they departed from the faith? So they've given heed to seducing spirits and which are doctrines of devils. So what are these seducing spirits? What does it mean to seduce? Mislead. Mislead, sorry? Deceive. Deceive? If you're seduced, capture. to capture someone, anyone else before we tie those together? Mislead. Yeah. The definition is roving as a tramp, that is, an imposter or misleader. Okay, so you're misled, you're trapped into some um, doctrine by people or spirits? It says to persuade, um, seduce, means to persuade, to disobey or disloyal, but it also deals with entice to sexual intercourse. So there is more to it than, you know, like how, like with Babylon and adultery, so it's tying in, seducing has sexual connotations as well. These people, are you smiling? No, I was just thinking, was that relevant? Was that relevant? Yeah, bringing the sexual uh, aspect into it. Because <laughs> when we think of... Why do you think it was irrelevant? No, I was saying, was it? I'm not asking. Yeah, but you inferred that it was irrelevant. Okay, I'm just wondering okay, where you, just you read that from, actually. Dictionary definition. Mm -hmm. The word to I can't find it anywhere. But it's in Webster's dictionary. Miriam Webster's dictionary. I just typed in. Oh, Miriam. I'm looking at Lois. And I just gave the definition. These people, where were they originally? They were in the faith. So they've departed from the faith. How, why would you depart from the faith? Because you're going to get seduced out of it. Yeah? Okay, and this seduction was instigated by what mechanism? What, what, was, what produced this departing from the faith? Doctrine. The doctrines of the devil. So it's all about doctrines, isn't it? Yeah. So there's, there's, the problem with these people is they used to be in the faith and now they believe in these different doctrines and these doctrines have what done what? They seduced them into this other way of operating or other thinking. You're, you're defining the doctrines as the spirits, not as an influence that's presenting the false doctrine? No, I'm not saying that the doctrines are the spirits. Okay. I, I can't prove this, but I'm saying the spirits of people and the doctrines are the belief system that these people are foisting upon this group of people, this class of people. It is similar to when, when you use the word of God or the line. Um, somebody is needed to be a medium. Yeah. So the, the seducing spirit has to, just as how the time of the end and there's an increase of knowledge and then a formalization, with error there has to be the, a similar thing. There has to be an agent that is used to facilitate those false doctrines, then they can impart them to others. Do you agree with that, Sister Shamila? Mm. I didn't hear it clearly. So. You're not listening. <laughs> Naughty. It's 
Say that again. Louder. We didn't hear it either. Sound of mumbling. It sounded sort of mumbly. Mumbling. But you had your hand over your mouth. I said that it is similar to the reform line, where you have the time of the end and there is an increase of knowledge and a formalization of a message. Likewise, with the false, there has to be an agent, a human agency, that has increased light, according to them, and therefore put their message into words, whereby they are now being instruments used by Satan. Do you agree with that, Sister Shwella? Is there a short version to, can someone... It's people. Simplify. People. The spirits of people. Just change the word spirit and say yes, people. Yes, I agree. You agree with that? How do we know that? Great Controversy 343. No truth is more clearly taught in the Bible that God, by His Holy Spirit, especially directs His servants on earth. So if God's going to do that, what does Satan have to do? Yeah. Has to counter it in exactly the same way. It has to be people. Mm -hmm. So now this is why Sister Olivine is going to use seducing, which is some kind of sexuality introduced into that. Because men are now going to give some sexy, attractive doctrine, which is going to take you from this path to another track. Because it has to look better than what you've already got, doesn't it? Otherwise, why would you leave it? Oh, did you? And seduction, in, in, in that terminology, makes two become one. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it has all the connotation about marriage, about the woman riding the beast, mm -hmm. church and state, all of these things are all connected together. So I think you have, you have to see what the, de the definition of seduction is. So human beings seduce human beings. Mm -hmm. I just didn't see it in the Strong's or the Noah's website. Okay. That's the only reason I said, is it relevant? So it is relevant, it's just I didn't see okay. it. Verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So who's the one that has a seared conscience? Those who have departed from the faith, we agree with that. So those are the people who have had their conscience seared and they're speaking lies in hypocrisy. What does that mean? Speaking lies in hypocrisy. Well, the word hypocrisy means deceit. Acting under deceit. If you think about it, it, it's, a, it it's, it's a... I don't know if it even makes much sense. Does anybody speak lies not in hypocrisy? So here I am, it's Friday. So would that work? Yeah, so I'd have to be hypocritical about it, okay. wouldn't I? I'd have to cloud it up and, and give some kind of false information, pretend that it was, because otherwise you'd know, oh, it's a straight lie. Is there any way of lying except in hypocrisy? think that they're living righteously, but they're not. They're in hypocrisy, <coughs> and they're speaking what they knowingly or unknowingly think is, is truth, and it's a lie. Whiteboard sepulchre. Sorry? A whiteboard sepulchre. Did everybody get that? No, whitewashed. Whitewashed, whitewalled sepulchre. Mm -hmm. Looks really good on the outside. Mm -hmm. LDS. In terms of being able to speak lies and not be in hypocrisy, what about the cannibal that eats brains and he believes that he's fulfilling his moral high calling? It's a lie, but he's not pretending he's living up to his moral high calling. He's not being a hypocrite about it. So what does the hypocrisy why is it introduced this idea of hypocrisy? Why would you just lie in hypocrisy? Because you're intending, to, you're deliberately intending to deceive. So you're pretending to be something. You're deliberately doing it. 
Because if it was just lying, that would just be, you could just go in the room and lie to yourself. It would be a lie. That's, the, that's what Elder Jeff has just said. You don't need a relationship to lie. I can just go in my room and say, it's Friday today, and that's a lie. But I'm not doing it in hypocrisy. The hypocrisy is when you now have a relationship. So now it's with a focus or intention. So in that context, if he's going to be lying, he can say it's a lie to do this. But now the hypocrisy, he's going to teach his son that this is a good way to live. He's going to cloud that lie in a way that makes it into a truth. So that's why he becomes a, a hypocrite, because he's going to act the part of someone who's giving you good advice or doing something that's good as opposed to doing something that's bad. So I'm suggesting, I'm understanding that the concept of hypocrisy here is introducing the idea of a relationship, not just a factuality of some isolated truth or error, because that's just, that's just lie. The hypocrisy is now when you want to go to someone and you want to foist your lies upon them. So we've run out of time. Um, I'm not here on Sunday, so we'll try and remember where we got to uh, on Monday. Have a look at Ellen White's comments on these and, and have a think about it, the Greek and all of that, to see if we can break down this, this verse a bit more to try and understand. But remember, what we're trying to see is the conscience, we're trying to get this verse to un and understand it. It's connected to the time of the end. You know that conscience is the time of the end. It's not the empowerment or any of the other ones. Because it's conviction of sin, righteousness and judgment. It's the first step in the everlasting gospel. So it's the beginning of the first angel's message. All of it is connected to that. And think a little bit more about three-step prophetic test. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. Lord, may each of us, as we kneel before you, recognise that we are learners, that we need you to teach us, and we need you, Lord, to show us what is right and what is wrong. And when we have a fuller appreciation of what's right and what's wrong, may our consciences convict us and show us the way that we're supposed to be going. Lord, may we stop living lives where we ignore the truth that stare us in our face and we damage and wound our consciences to the degree that they're no longer able to have a voice. Lord, help us to have a clearer understanding of the truth because in so many ways we have not understood these truths correctly and if we're not careful we will receive the wrong branding. Please be with us, bless us and direct us. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.